So it's a really exciting time for the future of health and medicine. And as we take giant leaps into reinventing health and medicine, I think it's also helpful to take a, a step from where we stand. I'm, this is my actually first uh, time in, in India. and I actually saw this poster on the back of a bus saying, get ready to step into the future. I hope you're ready, but let's see where we're stepping from. Where is healthcare today? You know, healthcare is actually sick care, if you think about it. We're not really spending our time on the health part of the equation. We're often very reactive. We wait for the heart attack, the stroke, the lump to be large enough to be diagnosed. So health is reactive. We wait for heart attacks, strokes, the lumps to be detectable. And it's intermittent. The data that we get is often scattered between random lab visits, uh, EKGs you get in the clinic, uh, uh, scribble numbers based at home, and amongst sometimes electronic records or paper records, often hard to access and to digest. And the feedback loops between you and your physician, or even understanding your own data, are often broken and hard to acquire. Access is often limited to physicians. In many parts of rural India especially, there are very few primary care physicians or specialists. And even when you do have access to these physicians, they have a challenge of educating themselves, of keeping up with the rapid pace of new technologies uh, and studies. So healthcare has been practiced in many ways in the same silos and buckets for, for decades, for hundreds of years. But we have a chance to think differently, not in the old model, whether you're in San Francisco or Africa or India, of waiting for the doctor for an hour for your 10 minute visit. We have an opportunity to reinvent things and shift things from this sick care side of the equation to the healthcare side. And technology and you yourself can play an important role in that. Another important role is realizing that your doctor is not the god. We like to think we're gods. But you are actually the CEO of your own health. The new drug is the empowered, engaged patient. You, you own your own health, you own your own data, and hopefully the understanding, and you're part of your own healthcare solution. So technology is certainly moving very, very quickly. We're living in this exponential age, the age of, of Moore's Law. I actually have an iPhone 1 in my pocket, it's an antique now. Think how quickly these technologies are moving along this exponential curve, and it's this exponentials in many fields where we have the opportunity to disrupt and change. I mean, think about it, the desktop of 2000 now fits on your smartphone and now fits on your, on your smart watch. And it's not just Moore's Law and IT, it's many technologies that are coming together, getting faster, cheaper, and smarter, and a price point that's becoming very accessible. And technologies are disappearing and dematerializing. You don't go and buy a GPS unit, now you oftentimes download the app. And here in India, you have these amazing 35 to $40 tablets, which are starting to democratize education and can play an incredibly important role in healthcare. So with these new technologies, we can reimagine all sorts of things, how we, how we buy things, how we read books, how we see movies. You know, companies like Blockbuster in the US have gone bust. I don't know how many of you use Ola or things like Uber. That's disrupting the travel industry, and it's because it makes travel and finding a cab or a limo easy and delightful, but it's disruptive, and it's also seamless and integrated. Who's going to build the Uber of healthcare? Well, there are actually companies building an Uber of healthcare where you press a button and a doctor comes to your house. Not sure what kind of doctor, but you can rate them and they can rate you. In fact, Uber in the United States last week announced a little campaign called Uber Health where you could press a button on your smartphone and an Uber car would come with a vaccination for flu season. So new ways of thinking are disrupting all sorts of fields. These are just a few examples and have an opportunity to reshape many elements of health and medicine. So I've been honored to chair the medicine track at Singularity University since its inception six years ago, where we look at grand challenges. How do we take technologies and address big issues, poverty, education, and healthcare? And about half of the projects that have come out of our 10-week summer programs have been healthcare related. I also run a one-week or a four-day program around the future of medicine called Exponential Medicine, which will be next week in San Diego. And it's the theme of Exponential Medicine at Singularity University that new thinking is coming across healthcare. So let's look at a few areas health and prevention. The best thing you can do is actually get up and move. 30 minutes of exercise, dance, running, jogging, whatever it is, is the most effective thing for your health. Maintaining or losing a little bit of weight can be the most impactful thing to longevity and health and happiness. And technology is starting to play a role in tracking that. We have a whole new range of tools that can give us insights into our steps, into our sleep. I'm wearing about six different ones right now. How many here have used a Fitbit or something like that in the past? Not a third of you, right? These are becoming ubiquitous. In fact, they're starting to disappear into our phones, into our watches. They can track our sleep. Another important thing you can all do is get six to eight hours of sleep a night. And that can be tracked and quantified. And these sensors 
are moving from simple step counters to more integrated ones. They're integrating into our smartphones. Samsung is building health phones. They're in our watches. Um, you'll hear from Wello later that's making some amazing technology. They're integrating into our clothes, into our cars, the Internet of Things, even our, our diapers. You know, you can imagine, this used to be science fiction, but now Huggies came out with TweetPee. You can figure out what that does. There are onesies that can track your children. This is my, my new son, Leo, wearing a onesie and donating his data to science. And so he's a healthy little guy, but for other kids, that could be game-changing. And these technologies are starting to disappear into epidermal tattoos or into contact lenses that Google makes that now can track blood glucose. And they're partnering with big pharma like Novartis to get that in the market. Or pills you can swallow to image your upper GI tract, but from wearables to incitables. Now, all this data is just data. What do we do with it? What does it mean to you individually? What do these trends mean? How do, we, how do we do what I call predictalytics? Well, think about your modern car. You don't care about any of the sensors in your car. You care about when your check engine light goes on. So I think in the near future, this integration of data from all sorts of elements is going to be, give you your own personal check engine light, which means you may need to go and be proactive and see your clinician or healthcare provider early. And these systems will evolve and blend with artificial intelligence. To have your own personalized GPS unit that says, Daniel, go right to the gym or go do yoga and not left to the fast food restaurant, right? Those sorts of things will start to be embedded in our life. But we know behavior change is hard. So what if you could see the you of tomorrow, right? You of tomorrow. You of tomorrow if you work out even more. You of super tomorrow. What if you keep having, you know, donuts for breakfast every morning? You of tomorrow. You can use technologies today to see you of tomorrow. Here's me now, here's me a thousand donuts later. You know, I wait a little bit. What if I'm talking to a young patient who's a smoker, and many in India smoke, so good thing for not smoking is to quit, but what if you could see what that does to your skin and have an augmented reality version of you and see the changes that smoking will bring in the near future? That can change behavior. Or if you spend too much time on Facebook, also another problem. So we have new tools to augment our reality. Things like Oculus Rift are fancy, expensive devices, but Google's come out with almost a free version on cardboard. You slot your phone in and you have 80% of an Oculus Rift. Incredible ways now to re-see our environment and train our brains to behavior change that's positive. Other things that are impactful are understanding our own genomics. The human genome, the price of sequencing a genome, has dropped from millions of dollars to $1,000. You can spit in a tube and drop that in the mail, and for 100 US dollars, have millions of your base pairs analyzed, which help you predict and prevent diseases. Now, it goes beyond the usual genomics. There's the exposome, there's the microbiome. We are actually super organisms. It turns out that the bugs in our gut are very important in our obesity, in our inflammatory bowel disease, maybe even cancer. And we're even using now therapeutic fecal transplants, not sexy, but a way to cure some infectious, infectious diseases of the gut, and maybe in the future, cure autoimmune diseases and even treat obesity. Wellness and prevention is in your hands. You can now measure it in new ways. You can even start to optimize your health. Here in India, you have an amazing tradition of, of meditation and yoga and beyond, and we're starting to unlock the secrets of the brain and neuroscience to the point where you can understand these brain waves. You don't need a fancy device like this. You can now buy for a few hundred dollars a, a connected brain-computer interface. I can wear this headset. It can pick up my brain waves and tell whether I'm focused or not when I'm playing a game. This is being used for children who have attention deficit disorder, and they can then get off of Ritalin uh, and off of drugs. Or I can use this headset to help me meditate and see that I'm actually calm for a whole five minutes there. I could prescribe this to a patient who has anxiety or depression instead of a drug, prescribe meditation, for example, and ways to track it. With fancy brain-computer interface, we can enable the quadriplegic who's locked in, who can't move, with a chip on their brain to actually control a robotic limb. So incredible new ways to connect our brains to technology to improve. How about new ways of doing diagnosis, right? You all know the old stethoscope. That's the old stethoscope. That's the basic stethoscope. Today, we're in the era of the digital stethoscope. And these stethoscopes come with apps, and the apps can listen to your heart, and they can do a better job in many cases than me or a very trained cardiologist in understanding what's happening in, with your heart condition. In fact, a medical student or a nurse in a rural village in India can do a better job than a cardiologist using these. So we're de-skilling what used to be complex tasks using some of these new connected smart devices. It could be uh, an exam like iNetra that can do uh, optom optometry exams that's, that's already been rolled out in India. It can be attachments for your smartphone to look in your ear of your children. There's a whole new realm of digital doctor tools that are emerging. Everything from an EKG case that I can snap on my phone, it can do a live EKG, so I can attach this and do EKG live, send this to my doctor anywhere on the planet. And if I don't read the EKG, the app can read it, or a cardiologist connected to my app can read it. 
In fact, you don't even need to have a connected device. There are now patches today, $2 a day. I'm wearing right now a connected patch. It's talking to my smartphone. And if we can go uh, live to the live screen here, you'll see my live data. Let's switch to the live screen. There we go. Um, my heart rate's 127. My stress is only 99%. Thanks, guys. If I, if I move around and I run around the stage, it'll show my steps. If I fall down and I don't get up, it will uh, tell me that or call my mom. It, it'll do my EKG. It usually shows the EKG, but right now it's showing the EKG on my smartphone. But this is picked up from anywhere in the world. This is an intensive care unit on a smart disposal package. How will this change how you monitor patients in the hospital, outside of the hospital, and sometimes actually see your data on the screen? Let's switch back to the slides. So new ways to collect data and transmit it is incredibly powerful. What if I found that I had some heart condition? Instead of getting an angiogram and die up the heart, I can do a 30-second CT scan today and recombine, using the graphics data, what's happening in my blood vessels. Do I have a narrow blood vessel? Do I have heart disease? Do I need a bypass or do I need a stent? What kind of stent? Maybe I'll 3D print the stent to match the individual patient. Or replacing the echocardiogram. We can do a quick MRI scan, reconstruct the entire anatomy of the, the chest and all the functions of the heart and send that back to the clinician on their tablet in real time. So many new ways to make smart diagnosis. Even taking lessons from the military world and intelligence. The U2 spy plane can take pictures, compare before and after. Now you can download an app and look at your skin lesion and compare before and after. And is that a melanoma or a mole? And these sorts of apps are blending artificial intelligence. And IBM Watson, which has gone to medical school, it's not just AI, it's IA, intelligence augmentation, where Watson has gone to medical school and is now being accessible through APIs on smartphones. So we're democratizing knowledge anywhere there's a connected device. In fact, there's been an X prize to make a super connected device, make a medical tricorder. There's been dozens of hundreds of teams that ended this competition. One of the leading teams started at my future medicine program called Scanadu. They have a little device, you have it at home, you hold it to your forehead, picks up your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your blood pressure, your stress level, communicates that to your smartphone, integrates that, can share that with your medical team, and 10,000 of these will be shipping as part of an FDA trial later this year. Of course, it's not just about your vital sign data, how about your lab data? We now have labs on a chip integrating to the point where you can do complicated tests at home or at any any uh, small clinic. And some of those tests are coming to our hands. A, a urinalysis stick, you dip in the urine, you take a picture, you have your analysis result. Or if it's flu season, you don't want to go to the clinic and get everybody else sick, you can spit in a little tube, the lines will show up, you take a picture with the app, and it can diagnose influenza, or maybe Ebola, right? Uh, in fact, just published last week, Harvard has come out with a paper-based saliva detector for detecting and screening for Ebola. So these technologies can become democratized and play a role in infectious disease and bring us this idea of a digital checkup from anywhere. The same care you get in New York, San Francisco, downtown Mumbai, you can get anywhere on the planet with connectivity and bring us the next level of therapeutics. So where's therapy heading? Soon I won't just prescribe you a drug or device, I'll prescribe you an app. It may be an app for diabetes. This is a now FDA approved app that's prescribed and is shown to improve diabetes outcomes. I might prescribe you an app for behavior change if you have prediabetes to prevent you from going out the direct direction. And these applications are starting to so benefit. Mayo showed that an application like this would help heart failure patients from coming back and forth to the hospital. In the future, you'll visit your physician maybe 50% of the time through your application. There's a whole new range of technologies and telemedicine where you would visit your doctor on your app, on, on, through your mobile device. So a, a rural village without a primary care doctor may have one be able to visit in that way and replace a dermatologist. Dermatology picture, an app, this is my actual problem a few months ago. I used an app to make the diagnosis and then went and saw a doctor and took it off. Two apps in one visit. Telemedicine is clearly playing a role here in India and abroad, but as these technologies get sm smarter, faster, and cheaper, they're going to give us new skills, new connectivity, and new insights. And maybe even blended with telepresent robotics when the doctor comes to visit you on the robot or you visit the doctor in that way. We're starting to augment the physician or nurse or whomever is visiting you with tools like Google Glass. A perfect use case is using these technologies so the nurse, the medical student, the physician can see data, can ask Dr. Google or Dr. Siri or Dr. IBM what might be happening to have new tools. We're personalizing therapy. I'm trained as an oncologist. We know that today, most cancers, you have lung cancer, we treat it the same. We're learning now to sequence every tumor, understand what drugs may best treat it using uh, complex or algorithms, and create a personalized cocktail for the patient. So my hope is the future of oncology will not be one of stage three and four medicine, but stage zero where we pick it up early and treat it smartly to end up with long-term cures. 
Robotics can help cure cancer by pulling out tumors. We're seeing robots play a role in surgery. They're starting to replace anesthesiologists, so there's an opportunity for disruption in that field. We're seeing robotics become wearable for the disabled. This woman is paralyzed from the waist down. She's wearing an exoskeleton, and parts of it are 3D printed to match her anatomy. She can now walk again. It's incredibly powerful for rehabilitation, not just for the paralyzed and beyond. And speaking of 3D printing, 3D printing is starting to impact healthcare in incredible ways, whether it's making a prosthetic for a young child that changes as they change, that can be printed for only a few dollars, to complex orthopedic devices that match your own anatomy, to knee and hip implants that match your specific anatomy, or you can even use a, a Microsoft Connect to scan you and, and print yourself. Here's mini-me, kind of cute, right? But what if I had a patient who was missing part of their face from cancer? I can make a matching prosthetic. So new ways to use um, 3D printing across healthcare in many places where you don't have some of these advanced technologies, these printers are coming way down in price. What about the global impact of these technologies? Mobile is, of course, very important here in India. It's very important in Africa as the primary fo form of medical contact and communication. We're seeing um, apps built by IBM and others start to track Ebola and give us foresight in prevention of pandemic diseases. We're seeing these new smart tablets hold your medical records and communicate to the cloud so your data is always accessible and it can be mined and you can receive information and understand it yourself. It'll be your personal health record. And I think if we're smart about this, both for wellness, prevention, diagnosis, and therapy, we'll start to democratize healthcare and bring first world medicine anywhere. In some cases, the first world medicine will come to you by drones, right? It's not actually science fiction. One of our Singularity University companies called Matternet has built a system to deliver drugs and vaccines to wherever you might need them, especially in parts of the world with, which have poor transportation. So drones and other UAV technologies are moving exponentially and can be used in smart ways to apply to healthcare. So discovery, how do we shift the long tail of clinical trials? What if you had a Parkinson's patient and could send them a clinical trial on their mobile device and their wearable device could track their shaking, for example? Or if you can become a data donor, share your genome, share your mobile health data, share your microbiome, all those will lead to new solutions. Well, we'll start to map our environment just like we map our airplane traffic. We'll start to understand what's happening around you. Just like when you drive with Google Maps or Waze, you share a little bit of data, a little bit of privacy, but with that we can build a map of Rome just from the driver data, and you share that privacy, but you now get some data back. You know the best routes to go, the best health route for you in the future. So I encourage you all to become part of the future of healthcare. Start to be a data donor, not just an organ or blood donor. And realize that the future of health and medicine is this convergence of all these fast-moving, integrated technologies. And no matter what field you're in, you can start to apply them to healthcare to move us from an era that's been episodic and reactive to one that's continuous and proactive. And I think that will enable us to take giant leaps forward, realizing that in many cases, like with my Google Glass, the future's already here. Not just even, it's just not evenly distributed. And it's up to all of us not to predict the future, but go out there and take the great steps to create it. Thanks very much.